Hello everyone. It's been a bit heavy on this channel lately, so today I wanted to just relax and have some fun talking about a classic gaming series, namely Ultima. The Ultima games are the creation of Richard Garriott, and there are nine installments in the main series. He plays a character who travels from Earth through a portal to the fantasy world of Britannia, a world that's ruled over by your friend, Lord British, the in-game persona of Richard Garriott. Since Ultima 4, you've been known in Britannia as the Avatar, a champion of virtue who adheres to an ethical system that you can think of as being like Catholicism, but without the theistic elements. Ultima 7 is generally considered to be the height of the series, and it was the very first installment I played when I found this very copy on sale as a kid. I'd never even heard the name Ultima before, but I was blown away by just how much depth Ultima 7 had. Up to that point, the most complex game I'd ever played was Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Now these days I own and have played every Ultima game, but back then I was woefully unprepared for games as sophisticated, and honestly, I think I was just too young to understand them. As a role playing game, Ultima 7 has everything. Combat, magic, a plethora of equipment to find, up to 6 companions of your choosing, the requirement to feed yourself and them, lots of interesting characters to meet, a complicated plot that involves philosophical speculation and moral dilemmas, secrets, a day and night cycle that changes the behaviour of the non-player characters, and complete freedom of movement around what is quite possibly still the largest fantasy video game world. Getting anywhere in any Ultima game demands dedication. There's no journals, quest logs or mini-maps to help you. You need to sit there and take note of everything you learn if you want to have a chance of succeeding. And I absolutely love that, because you get far more immersed than if you're just absent-mindedly following a marker to your next objective. The Ultima series is true old-school role-playing, and Ultima 7 is the pinnacle of that series. However, it's not the much-loved Ultima 7 that I'm here to talk about, but rather the much-reviled Ultima 8. Why is it so reviled? Well, there's two main reasons. The first reason is that it took a completely different approach to the series, and the second reason is that it was released essentially unfinished, and this resulted in many plot holes and many technical issues. Although, to be honest, getting games like this to work back in the day wasn't that easy, even when they were working as intended. I remember that in the case of both Ultima 7 and Ultima 8, I had to mess around with EMS for ages before they worked, and in the case of Ultima 7, I ended up having to use a boot disk. Now, if you don't know what EMS and boot disks are, then be very grateful, but regardless, Ultima 8 was the first installment in the series that really disappointed fans. But, you know what? I love this game, and I'm going to tell you why. As I said, since Ultima 4 your character has assumed the role of the Avatar, a champion of virtue in the land of Britannia. In every installment that came after, Richard Garriott placed you into increasingly difficult moral dilemmas, and nowhere did he do that more than in Ultima 8, which opens with the Guardian, an antagonist introduced in Ultima 7, banishing you to a different world altogether. You have been a thorn in my side for far too long, Avatar. Your two worlds will be crushed. Britannia first, then Earth. I shall parade you before their conquered peoples as the fallen idol of a pathetic ideal. No one here knows of the Avatar. So you wake up on the shores of Pagan with only one thing in mind, returning to Britannia to prevent the Guardian from destroying it and finding a way to return to Britannia is what Ultima 8 is all about. Much like with Ultima 7, I think that Ultima 8 was just too complicated for me <laughs> as a kid, so although I got fairly far in it, I never managed to finish the game. Now, when I first had the idea of making this video, I thought, okay, I'll load up Ultima 8, I'll play it for an hour or two, just record some basic footage, and then I'll make a video talking about it. Well, I ended up playing the game for 16 hours and finishing it for the very first time. I now have over a terabyte of footage on my second hard drive. So, needless to say, I have earned the right to give you my definitive opinion of Ultimate 8 Pagan. So, prepare for spoilers. 
Now you may have noticed that Ultimate 8 has something of a dark tone, and while that's something that a lot of people hate, it's something that I really love about it, because that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> but before I start gushing over the game, let me explain why it disappointed most fans of the series. First of all, the game world is far smaller than in previous instalments. The only major city in the game is that of Tenembrae, and there just isn't much to do there. You can't forge swords or bake bread for a laugh like you used to be able to, for example. You also no longer have to eat, though you can still get drunk. The world itself is often criticised for being too grey. Almost every dungeon is a grey cave of some kind and there's very little variation. Now this is a valid criticism, but you know, I actually think this was an intentional and rather bold decision on the part of the developers. The world of Pagan is basically a volcanic island, after all. But I agree that the lack of visual variety can be problematic. You'll spend a lot of time lost, not because the environments are particularly labyrinthine, but because they're so visually indistinct for the most part. There's no companions in Ultimate 8 either. You're on your own. You're also far more restricted in the way that you can behave. A challenge in past Ultimate games was in trying to adhere to the Avatar's code of ethics, because like in real life, it's just much easier to adhere to no code of conduct at all. Your companions would start complaining and even abandon you if you started stealing and doing other unethical things. But the point is that you could do those unethical things, and even get away with it if you were clever. You could even go so far as to kill plot essential non-player characters. Yeah, doing so made the games unbeatable, but that's the degree of freedom you had. In Ultimate 8, however, plot essential NPCs are just straight up invincible, and while it is possible to steal things sometimes, in most cases if you step out of line, the town sorcerer, Baron, teleports in and blows you up. Instant day. But what people seemed to hate the most was the introduction of jumping. Now I acknowledge that when the game was first released the jumping was a disaster, but after the patch, honestly, I didn't have a problem with it. I mean it's not perfect, but come on, I can think of a hundred games with worse jumping mechanics. I also don't mind the absence of levelling up. In Ultimate 8, the avatar improves his strength merely by swinging his weapon, and improves his intelligence by casting spells. People say that this can be exploited too easily, but I don't really see it as a problem. I mean, if you stood there and practiced swinging a weapon, you would get stronger. Yeah, it's not the ideal game mechanic, but it's reasonable, and at the end of the day, no one's forcing you to exploit it, are they? Now, the greatest disappointment for me is that, because the game was released unfinished, a lot of things happen that just make no sense. Let me give you a good example. The city of Tenebrae is ruled over by a tyrant called Lady Mordia who'll kill you for so much as talking to her the wrong way. She has the power of Tempestry, which is essentially power over water, and it's something that's hereditary. You eventually discover that Devon, the fisherman who found you at the beginning of the game, is actually the true ruler of Tenebrae, being the firstborn brother of Mordia, and that he therefore also has this power, though he himself is unaware of it. You get arrested as you discover this secret and taken to the docks where Devon is about to be executed on false charges, at which point you reveal the truth to everyone. This results in a showdown between Mordia and Devon, in which Mordia is killed. Now that's all great, and in the Ultima games, such sequences have always been like little rewards for the progress you've made so far, and they made you want to keep playing. But because Ultima 8 was released unfinished, even these great sequences are tainted by really obvious plot holes. To start with, for some reason, in this scene, and in this scene alone, Devon starts referring to you as the Avatar, but of course, no one in the world of Pagan is meant to know who or what the Avatar is. Now when you reveal the truth about who Devon is, everyone there refuses to carry out Mordia's orders to execute him. So Mordia strikes everyone down with her insta-kill lightning. However, it turns out that even Mordia can't kill plot essential NPCs in Ultimate 8, because the only ones who actually die are the nameless guardsmen. That's convenient. Also, how is it that Devon is able to defeat Mordia when he only just found out about his powers? At the end of the sequence he says that he needs to go and think about things, and he leaves by walking across the sea. Jeez, I sure wouldn't be as confident as to do that with my newfound powers, especially since falling into the water is instant death in Ultimate 8. Finally, Mordia being overthrown should have been the most important thing to have ever happened in the lives of the citizens of Tenebrae. The change in their society should have been like day and night. But nothing changes except that Devon now wanders in the same places that Mordia used to. Even as a kid I was really interested in story and character, and so after Mordia died I started returning to every NPC in the game to find out how they felt about it, only to discover that a lot of people talked as if Mordia was still in charge. 
I guess the developers just never had the time to write new dialogue, and that's a shame. The fact that the game was left unfinished also results in other problems. One of the things I love doing in the Ultima series is exploring the world and discovering new things, sometimes secret things. Imagine stumbling upon a book that tells the story of an ancient weapon of great power. From that story, you manage to derive certain pieces of information pointing to where the weapon might be found. In previous Ultima games, you'd be able to go out there and find it, but in Ultima 8, you're never sure whether there's actually something to find, or if you're just wasting your time, because you don't know if the developers ever got around to adding it to the game. In actual fact, there's very little to do or discover that isn't part of the main plot. Now, 2D isometric games come with their own inherent issues, but most of the other problems with Ultima 8 are just a result of the fact that the game is now so old. Look at this, I'm being mauled by the living dead and I'm in dire need of a health potion. But there were no quick bar slots back then, there's no hotkeys. I've got to rummage around in my inventory to find and drink a potion, all the while trying to evade two skeletons who'll finish me in a single hit. And in Ultima 8, Death is death. I mean, yeah, you can save and load games at any time, but there's no checkpoints or even the possibility of being resurrected like there was in past Ultima games. If you die, you're just dead. But you know, <laughs> I kinda love that. Let me tell you what else I love about Ultima 8 and why, despite its flaws, I think it's a great game. First of all, not only is Ultima 8 without a doubt the most atmospheric of all the Ultima games, there's just no other game with an atmosphere like it. There's no sunlight on Pagan. It exists in an eternal state of twilight, and because the game's visuals and themes are so bleak, you really do feel like you're completely isolated on a hostile and alien world. Everything is just so dark and downbeat, and the music, which is easily the best the series has ever had, although admittedly there was never much competition before this, contributes massively to that. It's consistently ghostly and foreboding. Wonderfully, the Guardian also chips in now and then to taunt you regarding your predicament. The sound effects are really crisp too. The sound of boot meeting stone is really satisfying, and the crunch of grass beneath your feet makes me believe that it's frozen. Even though no one ever says so, I get the impression that the world of Ultima 8 is a cold one, which it would be with the sun being permanently hidden. You know, my favourite nights in real life are the dark and icy nights. I find them really romantic. Running around the world of Ultima 8 reminds me of those nights. Now the fans complained about the fact that you can't have companions, but this game gives you more control of your own character than ever before. You couldn't climb and jump around in any Ultima game before this, and can you imagine trying to manage AI companions while engaging in this kind of activity? It's been 23 years since Ultima 8 was released and developers still haven't managed to make AI companions anything other than an annoyance and a hindrance. It was bad enough in the previous Ultima games having to manage all of their inventories. I'm glad you're alone in Ultima 8, and if you weren't alone, the whole feeling of the game would be lessened. <laughs> People always want to focus on the elements of the Ultima series that they feel were missing here, but what about those elements that were retained? Even though the game world is smaller than in Ultima 7, Ultima 8 is still a big game, and after you've played through it you really feel like you've been on some epic quest. There's still plenty of great characters to meet, lots of interesting places to explore, lots of equipment to find, and you'll end up doing all those silly things that video game fantasy heroes always do, like eating a fish you find on a corpse that must be decades if not centuries old. Mmm, tasty. In fact, while it's true that, as I said earlier, there's actually very little to discover that isn't related to the main plot, when the game does present those opportunities, I really don't think they've been done better in any other ultimate. I mean, here I've fallen into some forgotten tomb, and as I explore it, I discover a series of books, each of them offering a clue that will lead me to the other, and then finally, a magic weapon called Slayer. Of course, the place is full of monsters and traps, but once you find that treasure, it's just so satisfying. I think that what makes this so enjoyable in Ultima 8 is that you have so much more control over your character. Unlike in, say, Ultima 7, you don't feel like you're managing several characters, one of which you happen to be able to move around. No, you are your character. It's not just the avatar that's exploring that tomb, you are. This is yet another reason that I don't think that adding companions to Ultimate 8 would have been a good idea, even if it had been technically possible. 
Despite how dark the themes of Ultimate 8 are, you still feel like a hero. I'm really bored of the endless anti-heroes of the modern day. I like my classic heroes who at the very least have honourable intentions and try to perform noble deeds. In Ultimate 8 you feel like you're doing that, and this is another case where the music helps a whole lot. The game retains the humour of the series too, both intentional and accidental. In my playthrough I just finished being addressed by three gods who manifested themselves through these statues. They told me to access the room behind them, kill a ghost there and claim an item that I'd need to leave Pagan. So I kill the ghost and while I'm in there I decide to loot his chests as any adventurer would. One of the chests contained some alcohol and I decided to have a drink. Why not? Unfortunately, I seriously underestimated the power of the alcohol. So there I am, the avatar, a champion of virtue who has just banished an ancient spirit and claimed an item of incredible power, returning to present myself before the gods utterly wasted. Well done, mortal. How embarrassing. Oh yeah, and you know how that statue's speaking? Well, back in the day they released a speech pack for Ultimate 8 that added voices to important characters in the game, with mixed success. But back to this haul, let me give you another example of one of the ways that Ultimate 8 carries on another proud tradition of the Ultimate series, namely the tradition of having puzzles that are near impossible to figure out. As I said, those gods tell you to go through the door behind them, but it's locked and there seems to be no way of opening it. This is where I got stuck as a kid. I spent hours searching every corpse in this dungeon for a key, but there's nothing. You know what the solution is? You know how you get through that door? You have to use a Dispel Magic Portal Scroll to unlock it. Now let me explain to you how ridiculous that is. Every other time you use a Dispel Magic Portal Scroll, it's for the purposes of, well, dispelling magic portals. No one ever said anything about them being able to unlock doors and there's not one thing that indicates that they'll be able to open this one door specifically for no particular reason. This is the kind of thing you'd only ever discover by trying everything. So how did I find the answer? Well, in the modern day I own the entire Ultima series on my Good Old Games account and Good Old Games provide every piece of supplemental material that was ever released for each of them. We're talking maps, fiction, reference sheets and guides. All of the stuff that I never had access to as a kid. Now I'm someone who abhors cheating and using walkthroughs with a passion, but I am not ashamed to say that I resorted to one in this case. And now, knowing the solution, I'm very glad I did. You could have given me a thousand years and I'd never have figured this out. But that's the Ultima series for you. Sometimes you're just plain misled. In this section I was told that I'd have to use a resist heat spell to cross the lava and claim an item. That's fine, but they left out two important details. One was that there was a demon guarding the item, and the other was that I'd also have to make it back across the lava. But the spell only lasts a short amount of time and I only prepared to cast it once. I had no choice but to make it across, dodge the demon, claim the item, and then make it back in record time. I did it eventually, but not before dying over and over and over again. Now look, I know that games are games, they're just entertainment, but I'm dead serious when I say that anyone who manages to beat an Ultima game without referring to a walkthrough has truly accomplished something great in their lives and deserves a medal, and honestly, I am not one of those people. Although quests in the Ultima series have often been pretty elaborate, they've never been quite as depressing as they are in Ultima 8. One of the first things you see in the game is this guy being beheaded by Lady Mordia who ends up throwing his corpse in the water. His wife is there and sees the whole thing. Later on in the game, her son goes mad with grief and ends up accidentally drowning himself. <laughs> now the thing about this is that the world of Pagan is ruled by four titans, one of which is called Hydros. She's the water titan. When people die at sea, Hydros turns them into an undead creature and enslaves them forever. So ending up in the water after death is essentially these people's version of hell. So not only does this woman have to endure the loss of a husband and a son within a few days of one another, but she also has to live with the knowledge that they're both being tormented forever. When you inform her of the death of her son, she breaks down crying and for the rest of the game she just sits there and cries. <sighs> 
And did I ever tell you about the time that, for selfish gain, I bullied a grieving mother into telling me that the ghost of her dead daughter carried a key so that I could go and disturb her grave and get it? Well, I did. Speaking of ghosts, there's something weird going on in the city of Tenebrae. Everyone speaks about ghosts in the same sceptical way that most people in the modern western world do, but Pagan is a world in which the people are fully aware that they're ruled over by four titans, that there's magic of all kinds, and that the countryside is plagued with ghouls. But ghosts? Well that's just ridiculous! But I mean, all they have to do is head north from this house and they'll see a ghost roaming openly within the city limits. Learning new spells in Ultimate 8 is as rewarding as ever. What I always found satisfying in games is being able to overcome a problem that was previously insurmountable with the use of a new ability, item or spell. Take this for example. You know that key that I mentioned getting off the ghost of that girl? Well it lets you into this dungeon in which you'll find this piece of magical armour. The problem is that it's enchanted in such a way that means that whenever you approach it, it moves away. But later on in the game, you learn a spell that allows you to dispatch a spirit to fetch things for you. Magic isn't just about problem solving though, you can have lots of fun with it too. Here, I paid a little visit to the local blacksmith during closing hours and then summoned a golem to go and bash the door in. There's no way I was paying those kind of prices. I love how unfazed that guardsman is as I stroll down the street with a golem following behind. Evening officer. He didn't suspect a thing until the abomination was already upon him. What's weird is that spellcasting is one area where Ultimate 8 does give you an incredible amount of license. I mean here I am having summoned a demon in the local pub. Baron doesn't show up to kill me and there's no consequence for my actions. I think the reason for this is that the game can't tell when you're committing crime indirectly. But the question is, why didn't they allow this kind of freedom in the first place? You can learn four schools of magic, thaumaturgy, necromancy, theurgy and sorcery. The process of learning spells from each school is very different but always seriously involved. For example, casting sorcery spells involves arranging candles and regents on a pentagram in a very specific way that depends on the spell. And yes, I did try killing Baron with all my sorceress power. It was an epic fight, but no, you just can't kill him. He does become your servant when you overthrow his master though, and I think that's even more satisfying. Now, this being Ultimate 8. The avatar betrays every value that he holds dear in the process of mastering these schools of magic. Along the way you'll participate in human sacrifice, talk to the dead, and even assist in dispatching a demon to murder someone. There's a weird meta thing going on here, because not only does Ultimate 8 make the avatar go against his core principles, it makes you as the player go against your core principles too. Well, I hope so anyway. Now you may wonder, why is the Avatar, the champion of virtue, doing all of these highly inappropriate things? Well it turns out that to be able to leave Pagan and return to Britannia, he needs to become a Titan, the Titan of Aether specifically. Then he has to construct, or rather reconstruct, a black gate, which is essentially a portal. This means mastering the four schools of magic and usurping the power of each of the four Titans and claiming a black rock item from them with which to construct the gate. The problem is that each time you claim one of the items, you destabilise the world of Pagan in a specific way. You see this meteor storm? Well, I caused that. The ultimate moral dilemma in a game full of moral dilemmas is that to save your own world, you have to doom another. Now that's a great concept. This kind of thought provoking dilemma is one area in which Ultimate 8 not only got a time honoured tradition of the series right, but in my opinion, did it better than ever. In the game's climax you defeat each of the titans and then finally construct the Black Rock Gate. Having done so, the Avatar steps into it and walks through a mysterious place between worlds, ready to return to Britannia and protect it from the Guardian. is a great ending. You doom the world of Pagan in order to return and save Britannia, only to find out that it's already been destroyed. It's such a shame that the sequel, Ultima 9, 
turned out to be an utterly irredeemable pile of dross in the eyes of almost everyone. In many ways I wish that Ultima 8 was a completely standalone story that just ended here. But then again, without the backstory of the Avatar's heroics, its themes just wouldn't work as well. The question is, would I recommend Ultima 8? That's a harder question than you might think. I just can't imagine someone brought up on modern, user-friendly games having the patience to come to grips with a game as clunky as games of this age typically are, never mind a game from a series known for its inaccessibility. So while I'd obviously love to recommend it, I'd only really do so to old school gamers who happen to miss it the first time around. Otherwise, think long and hard about whether or not you're prepared to dedicate yourself to learning a complex, but alta, admittedly, <laughs> rewarding game. I think that an adjustment of expectations is really key to enjoying Ultima 8 because it's not really a role playing game. In fact, it's not even an action role playing game. What it is, is an action adventure game with role playing elements. Personally, I love it and I'll almost certainly play through it again very soon. So that's it for this video, I hope you enjoyed this little old school detour and who knows, maybe I'll do it again at some point in the future, but for now, thank you very much for watching everyone and God bless you all. I was just packing everything away after making my review and I noticed that on the back of my little Ultima 7 manual here, I've still got the notes that I wrote as a kid over 20 years ago regarding how to get this thing working in DOSC with a boot disk and extended memory and things like that. I'm amazed I actually figured this stuff out as a kid.